Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> As people are still uh, arriving. But please uh, arrange yourself in the best way to be present for the next few moments while we sit together.
vast as the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. I think it's quite easy for, for all of us to uh, become so accustomed to the uh, sort of a ritual and the goodness of a meeting together like this. It's nice to, uh, to be reminded sometime of uh, what we're up to and to remember the importance of of bringing ourselves forward and showing up uh, for ourselves and, and for others. To know that this sitting that we do in the beginning isn't um, in preparation or waiting. It's the fullness of the entire practice expressed in our willingness to be upright and present and still and somewhat silent to remember our our true nature and to express it without trying to achieve something or get away from something or correct something, but to appreciate ourselves as ourselves. And then when we engage in some of the ritual, like the chant that we just did, can you imagine that each thing we chant, they're, they're different, each verse that we uh, repeat over and over is also the fullness of the teachings. Just in that the robe chant, which is normally done at the end of sitting, the zazen, in a Zen temple when people would put on their rakasus or their robes, which we're not doing so much, but yet that, that small verse is once again the entirety of the teachings. If everything is completely interdependent, then each place in each thing and each teaching is the is the wholeness expressed just in that one that one bit it's not just some rote thing that we're reflecting on and then i s step in and hold the place the function which we sometimes call teacher which actually isn't a thing but a function and in that function offer something to you as you function as students or listeners or but it we're both required it's not about rank or position we're required <clears throat> so the inquiry can emerge so that you can look at the places where you'd like to be more awake more present more immediate less caught more free and to use this time not as just a sort of spectator event, but something which is possible, assuming this was the only time we were to meet, this is the last time we would meet, what would you want to, to bring forward? So I just remind us of the importance of this immediacy. And because in this series, as I'm moving toward the larger ceremonies of Dharma transmission, I'm reflecting on my, my own teachers, people who've made a big difference. I find that I'm, <clears throat> I'm immersed in what I would call blessed grief. More, more blessing than sadness, a blessing, blessed grief, remembering these teachers that are no longer with us and how they are still alive. 
uh, in in me and in us and and my reflection on them isn't just a biography or a history not a documentary but a way to bring them all forward as if they were in one of the squares on zoom so um, that we meet an inquiry together i spoke about my root zen teacher blanche hartman and last week joko beck you know the powerful influence through uh, our work at Appamata and uh, one of the blessings that Peg brought to me is my connection with her. And today, the person I want to focus on, uh, just as a way to bring forward the teachings, is my primary uh, mentor and um, trainer, John Gladfelter. Some of you have heard his name. And because I... <clears throat> I've shown you images, especially of people you might not know. I'm going to show you an image here. And once again, the, the image is one of um, a dynamic uh, energy because that's, that's, our, that's our interest. This was taken by Cassie uh, when, as you know, one of our, our Sangha members. So once again, this in the early 2000s, you see the the aliveness uh, of the quality that we shared. I'm a little bit <clears throat> funny looking at myself, um, uh, laughing, but it's a dear image <clears throat> for me. And in some ways the um, I guess the way I would say it is a lot of what you see when I'm with you and when I'm working with people is John. He's a person who's had the greatest influence on my personal and professional development. You know, of course, I, I come from my um, uh, wonderful family and ancestors and um, but in terms of launching myself into um, uh, professional development and finding someone who could mentor me, he's the person that has had the, by far the most profound influence. I met John in 1975 when I was 24 years old, just entering graduate school. And he became my mentor, my trainer for the next 35 years until his death in 2012 when I was 60. And I was able to provide the eulogy at his memorial service. It was a long arc. He was the first person I met who was so unusual. His view of life um, and what he demonstrated, it meant to live into full human beingness, was shocking and completely intriguing to me. I'd never seen anyone like that. I took a friend with me one time I invited um, a friend of mine who um, my, my mom and sister will remember, Darwin Nelson, another great friend who has, has died. He was the director of the counseling center at the university when my dad was a professor and he was a good old friend of our family's. Very bright extremely bright and very f funny and kind of droll. And so after we had spent a full day with John in a training group, it's the first time that Darwin had been with him, I said, well, what do you think? And at that time, Darwin smoked a pipe and he was kind of sat there for a moment and he said, well, he's either overtly psychotic or a person of higher awareness. He was making a bit of a joke, but he was commenting on this uniqueness and the unconventional truth that John would express. In the beginning, I was too young and too immature to understand it, but I could recognize it. He was a PhD psychologist. He was a diplomat in clinical psychology with APA. He was a fellow of the American Group Psychotherapy Association, on and on. And I thought he was a psychologist and a psychotherapist. That's how I came to him. And it turns out he was a Zen master in disguise in a certain way. We have a lineage. 
he was my trainer. His trainer was Cornelius Buchenkamp, who was a psychoanalytic group psychotherapist in New York City. His um, was Frieda from Reichmann. Hers was Hans Alexander. His was Anna Freud, and hers was Papa. So there's a lineage that comes deeply in this way too. When I showed him the pictures of myself at San Francisco Zen Center with Blanche when I did Jukai back in 1995, we were both in robes. And Jean's only comment was, it'll be interesting to watch you grow into them. And so here I am. I want to say just a couple of things about his Dharma. Living intimately, and living practically, and living free. I would, I would say the three areas, just briefly. And once again, I give you this historical and this reflection to call up what's in you, what, what's alive in you that, that is looking for freedom. I asked John once if he had read anything in Eastern traditions, and he said, yeah, he had been influenced by a book called The Importance of Living, The Noble Art of Leaving Things Undone. It was by an author named Lin Yu Tang. It was written in 1937. It's an obscure little book, but it still is there. Um, John was born in 1922, so I'm not sure when he read it, but I, of course, got it since he mentioned it, like I always did with the books he recommended. I didn't find it that interesting, but he, he found it really powerful because this teacher as a Chinese gentleman, he was talking about what it meant to be a, a true person. And there were two things that did strike me that are echoes of our practice. He talked about a true person expressing or embodying wise disenchantment. I love that, term, wise disenchantment. And of course, we practice to release our self-centered that's our self-centered dream. Dogen would say body and mind dropping away as our true face is revealed. Ancient language, but a wise disenchantment from our conditioning, from our habit patterns. And this is, I think, what I was seeing in John that was so, and, and all of my teachers, it's like they, it was a wisdom as they let go of the selfing that we normally hold to. And the other thing that it came from the, the book is this person, the, uh, a, a true person, was characterized by the ability um, to live with a tolerant irony. A tolerant irony, which I read to be able to tolerate irony. It's like what all the koans demonstrate and what he was embodying. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher surprising, but you could tolerate this instead of scrambling for certainty, kept going deeper. I asked him once, do you have a particular philosophy that undergirds all the clinical things that he was teaching me? And he said, yes, expect nothing and appreciate everything. It's the complete foundation of our practice in some ways. All of what he would show me, teach me, work with me in, in therapy was to help reduce in me the, sort of a romanticism and sentimentality. All the ways that I tried to make the story better, hide behind something that was more pleasant than reality, and miss out on the beauty and the power and the liberating truth of wise disenchantment and a tolerant irony. He was showing me what profound care and real love looked like. His messages, if I had to summarize them, might look something like this. He would say, literally, he would say, I will not make you not okay. I refuse to do that. In other words, he, he was embodying over and over his unwillingness to believe my stories about myself, to listen to them, to take them seriously but not come to the same conclusions that I came to about myself and other people in the world. 
He would also communicate, I will not diminish you by taking responsibility for your life. I have confidence in you. As if he was communicating, you can do this. You have what it takes to live the life that is given to you. And that's precisely what our practice offers. You can do this. You have what it takes to live the life that is given to you. And I'll walk with you. But next, I will not coddle or inappropriately console you, but I will listen deeply. I'll care for you and always see the good in you. Always reflect your true nature, no matter what the problem you bring. And lastly, these messages, if I summarize them, I, I will support you in taking responsibility for your life, no matter what happens. I will support you learning to say, I will take care of myself and be responsible for my life, life no matter what happens. Not, I'll take care of myself and be responsible as long as, as it goes a certain way. A famous line I've used from John Tarrant, where he says, there are no circumstances under which it is wise to refuse life, is what John was saying. I'm not going to make you okay. I won't diminish you by taking responsibility from you. You can do it. I won't coddle you, but I'll see the good in you always, and I will support you in taking responsibility for your life. This was living intimately. Now, in terms of living practically, you've all heard me say, his definition of discipline, which, which I got from him, is remembering what you want. The discipline, living practically, wasn't about whipping yourself into shape or trying to be a good person. It's remembering what you want. This is the foundation of our practice and vow. Remembering what's most important. And in doing that, in terms of, I asked him one time, what, what do you think are the factors that make psychotherapy, that's what we were supposedly training in, work for some people, and some people it doesn't work so well. And he, he didn't answer in a complex clinical way. I, I was surprised what he said. He said that the difference is the capacity to experience gratitude. But this is the same as in practice. The release of a self-centered view. The willing to look at the way in which we organize around fear of losing love or not being able to gain love. A sort of a manager view of life. But the capacity to experience gratitude requires some sort of maturity. Asking what can I offer what's possible here rather than just what can I get? How can you take care of me? And so I ask him what maturity, what is maturity in your view? And he said, first, the capacity to think and feel at the same time. The capacity to think about the things that you're feeling and to notice what you're feeling about the things that you think. It isn't about just being in your head or just going to your heart. It's not that distinction. What does it mean to be an integrated, free-functioning human being? We just chanted, wearing the universal teaching. Everything included. And asking him about the practicality of relationships, which seemed to be the you know, the area where we rub up against others and have so much difficulty. I asked him about his relationship one time, his marriage, because I'd met his wife, Rose, at a university event. And at that point, it's a long, long time ago, I said, how are, how are your, how's Rose doing? He said, oh, she's, she's fine. We're uh, just coming up on our 40th anniversary. And he paused and he said, well, still not sure how it's going to turn out. And he laughed. It, it wasn't a sense that things were difficult. He was offering a teaching on impermanence and the reality of relationality. So ask him, like, why get married? 
why, why, what's the purpose of marriage? And he said, well, it's an interesting way to structure time. Like what? He said, look, life is difficult. It's quite challenging. And if you meet someone and you're drawn to them and they to you, you, you might make an arrangement that says, you know, this is, uh, this is something. <laughs> you you want to do it with me? You want to go through it with me? Once again, not romantic, not sentimental, but profoundly practical. And he said, you need a worthy opponent. Someone who can meet you fully. Not someone that you dominate or they dominate you. or Like a spiritual friend, like a true teacher. We can truly meet and help each other through life. Someone who challenges us and supports us in the ways that opens us to our fullness. Not because we need them, but because we're much greater because of them. Just like a teacher, just like a spiritual friend. The essence of liberating intimacy. So living intimately, living practically. And of course, like any good teacher, his... His focus was helping you live more free, more okay. I did two interviews with him, which you can see on Apamata Zen if you want to see them. They were later on in his life. A uh, second one especially, he wasn't his sharpest, but you get the feeling. And the feeling of uh, who he was and our care for each other. And when I sent the videos to him later, he... I said, what did you think? And he said, well, I realized I liked that guy. Would it be nice in your life if you watched the video of yourself or on the screen here to say the same thing? So here we, here we are. And here are the questions for your inquiry that come from these kinds of teachings. I'll, I'll say them as if I'm asking them of myself, but listen to them for, your, for yourself. With my practice, am I, am I more okay with myself? Am I more self-accepting? Where am I caught? With... Continued practice, am I more mature? The sort of growing up and waking up that I speak about, the, the deep wakeful quality of Zen practice, the profound growing upness of the kind of psychotherapy that John was showing me. <clears throat> am I more mature? Am I willing to look at my thinking habits and patterns? Am I willing to open my heart to others and to myself? To think and feel at the same time. Thirdly, am I less enchanted by my own stories about myself and about others and about the world I live in? Can I live with what Suzuki Roshi called the attitude of not necessarily so? Can I be more okay with myself? Am I more mature? Am I less enchanted by my own stories? And next, am I willing to decline the invitation that our culture asks of us to elevate excitement over intimacy, to get busy, to be excited, to always be doing some, something next, something new, something, and miss out on the intimacy and the immediacy of the moment. And I'm not willing to decline the invitation to always be on the drama triangle, either a persecutor or a rescuer or a victim, instead step off of it into intimacy, into the immediacy and the vulnerability that's required. Where self-acceptance, maturity, and less enchantment are, are useful. Am I more tolerant of life's ironies, all the paradoxes and surprises, because they're going to keep coming? 
life is not going to make sense in the way I think it might make sense. It's going to keep surprising us. And can we navigate that with improvisational virtuosity? <laughs> kind of interesting way that Peter Hirschhout talks about freedom. Improv, always. Can we, a virtuoso of this with practice, allows us. And lastly, do I live with some degree of discipline? In other words, do I live by vow? Or do I just live by ordinary conditions and reactivity? John didn't do a lot of writing. He wrote one long chapter in one textbook, um, sort of it's a, a book entitled um, Transactional Analysis After Eric Byrne. And so a lot of senior teachers who took Eric Byrne's teachings and carried them forward. <clears throat> the title of that chapter was Enjoying Every Minute. Imagine that in a clinical book that being your title, enjoying every minute. Appreciate your life. So what does this call forward for you? What are the areas that uh, you'd like to take a look at? Please join me. And I'm gonna ask first, um, and, and hopefully his um, audio is, is working. I, I want to call forward Wayne Carpenter if he's here um, as a beginning. And the reason I do is because Wayne and I grew up in the same environment. And for some reason, I just want to, <laughs> I want to hear from you. Well, we did grow up in the same environment and it was a lovely trip uh, through a lot of memories. Um, I, of course, knew John, uh, not in the same deeply intimate way that you did, but I knew him from TA conferences. And uh, in fact, Gene and I attended a workshop together um, with John that I'm, I believe you were present at. I think it was in Austin. Um, so I have very, very fond memories. Um, and it was lovely to hear uh, some of the old phraseology, uh, but so lovely uh, uh, updated and integrated with your own, your own person and your, your teachings. Um, so I was really loving what you were saying because it helped me make a little more sense of some of those uh, things that in some way became shibboleths within the community. Uh, people heard them and repeated them, but you grounded them and integrated them in a, in a lovely way. Um, and I- People that was um, a friend to me that helped in those early years of integration too. So I wanna thank you for that. Thank you. Well, and you showed me when you and I worked together ways of doing things that were uh, so different from the kind of um, Bay Area of California expressions of TA, mm -hmm. which were um, at that point, by that point, they were heavily laden with confrontation and uh, there had been a significant infiltration of behavioral psychology because some of the principal teachers had gone off and gotten their PhDs in schools where behaviorism was the focus. Um, and, you know, that's where ultimately I began to lose interest in that school and affiliated with Richard Erskine, at, who taught a, a much more relational form of transactional analysis. Well, wow. and now, um, just to complete, we, now we're at this point in our life and walking with each other towards the inevitable. Yes. So thanks for continuing to walk with me. No, thank you. It's, uh, as always, uh, 
a real blessing for me to use that overused word at the moment. And I'm so keenly aware of what of what you are saying about our impermanence uh, in that, uh, I don't know if you ever met Joshua Zavin who grew up in the transactional, transactional analysis community uh, who passed away uh, last February uh, or not, but, uh, and, and two other therapist friends of mine locally are in the last days or weeks of their life. So impermanence is, is here. Enjoy every minute. I, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. Yeah. Thanks, Wayne. Good. Oh, there we go. Lit. There you go. Okay. Well, this really resonates with me today. And of course, what arises for me is the, is the fact that I, I don't exercise the element of is discipline, remembering what I want. I've said that what I want is to do more painting and to try to get back to my um, guitar as as my tremor issue is resolved and and yet I haven't been doing much of any of that. So I'm um, curious why I would not. I mean, I have every opportunity. I'm retired, and it seems strange that I need these kinds of reminders. And yet, I don't turn towards what I say is important to me. Remember the last line on the, the Han, don't waste this precious life. Mm -hmm. And once again, that's not as a harsh confrontation. It's, it's a reminder, like Wayne and I were talking about. It's like, and you know this well, you don't, you don't know how much time we have. No, none of us do. No. It's like, uh, it, it's kind of a, a wake up. Good, please do. And then show us your work. All right, I will. Love to see it, I'd love to see you, thank you. Thank you. It's good to say these things in public sometimes because it <laughs> nudges you forward. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Good to be with all of you. Is Kathy next? <clears throat> Hello. Hi, Kath. Get myself situated here. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to say thank you for um, saying, um, pretend, you know, what if this is the last time we meet? Yeah. That was like a bolt, <laughs> you know, um, for me. Um, I've been thinking about. Uh, the other, a couple of weeks ago, you mentioned Joko's book or last week and I got it and I've been sort of uh, slowly going through it. And she said something that to me was just so straight to the matter, like the Dharma all in one sentence, you know, it was um, joy is uh, life as it is minus your opinion. And I was just like, Okay, there it is. <laughs> like, wow, thank you. You know, thank you for that. Um, because I have been having a lot of opinions lately about other people um, and struggling, you know, with yeah. the, the cycle of grief, fear, anger, you know, sadness, like, wow, you know, the, and we don't have to go into the world because we all know what it is. Um, but that's really been helping me. And, um, I also wanted to, to thank you for sharing about John because um, I have known you all those years you were talking about <laughs> and more and uh, before John and uh, and it, it really uh, helped me understand you in a different way from, uh, from you know, I'm still getting to know you. <laughs> yeah, we still continue that. We do, <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And and there's one more thing I want to thank you for. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I have a question or not, but um, when you were here visiting in May, uh, you know, you said something to me. You said, "Well, maybe it's time for you to for us to get you a studio," you know. And and my old way of thinking was like, "What? 
I can't do that. What are you talking about? You know, and um, I am now in the process of um, finding one. Huh. Um, it just I like Bridget saying, I'm not doing my artwork. Yes. Yeah. And Bridget. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, we're all in that one together because I was kind of on a roll for a while. And then I kind of, you know, let life. I don't know, whatever. No excuses. But I, you know, I've been also reading Blanche. I just do little bits at night and little bits of Yoko, Joko in the morning. And gosh, it's been helping me so much. And and I just, Saturday morning, as I was doing my writing, I just was like, oh, I, I think I need to, you know, find a place where I can go to, mm -hmm. not my bedroom, you know, table, which has been working fine, um, and, and do this thing, whatever it is. <laughs> I will know? take care of myself no matter what happens. That's right. And, you know, that realization, because, you know, I used to go, oh, I can't afford it. I don't know. I'm like, well, yeah, I can. You know, I do have some money. I, I can do that. I can, you know, what else am I going to spend money on? I'm staying at home. And, you know, kind of back in to not doing things um, outside the house too much, except a few chosen special things with friends. And, um, and it's like, I mean, it just kept opening. It was like, well, yeah, you can. And yeah, you know, people that you can talk to and you have a big community here, you can find out and you can do it. And now I'm like really excited. Like, oh, I get my bedroom hey, back. Man. All this stuff is giving you more freedom. Yes, yes. So, yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. It's, be it's beautiful to hear the Dharma coming out of your mouth and to see it enacted in your life. Amen, brother. Yeah. <laughs> There's one, uh, I know there's some other people waiting here, but there's another one other thing I'll say, which is more touchy and, and mothers they're listening to. Um, but it makes me cheerful to say it, so I want to say it, to, is that um, I could always feel how proud dad was of me and how it seemed like he was pained or had some jealousy around John. I can see why. And not, and I understand it. I don't resent it. I just, it was uh, tender. As a professor of psychology, I think there are some ways he hoped to be able to offer those things. And he offered his life to me. Uh, but there's some things that someone only outside of your family can offer. And so I'm just acknowledging both of those men together. And, uh, wishing that that wasn't such a struggle with dad, but I think it might have been, so. It was. Thank you. Love you. Love you too. Darcy next. Hi, Darcy. Oh my. Oh my, here you are. <laughs> so, your, your last comment just really, it's make, made me start crying. <laughs> me too. <laughs> you, can't, you can't be everything to your children, even though you want to. And that is just a fact. And it's also a source of joy when you know that you aren't everything to your children. Some relief in that uh, and some pain altogether. Pain. And uh, hopefully there's joy, I would hope, when a parent sees a child find a resource that's good for them. Yes, yes. And I would say really, you know, Keb, Keb's, um, being a part of Appamata is, you know, what helped me know about it. Right, it brought you. And, you know, so it's, it's kind of a bittersweet thing for me. Yeah, and, and for me, we each loved her, we each offered her all we could. Yes. Still. Yes. yes. 
the reason I raised my hand was I was so touched by your love for your teacher. And uh, I just wanted to tell you that I love you. And I love Peg. Absolutely. And uh, um, all of the teachers and mentors and spiritual friends of Alpha Mata. Uh, you talked about how you see things differently because of your practice. I am quite certain I could not be meeting life as it is the way I am without all of this support. I see that. And uh, I don't mean like being strong. I mean, allowing right. what is there to be there. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, a way, it's a way of meeting it that I don't think I would have ever dreamed of. So I, I really thank you from the bottom of my heart. And of course, all of those who support you have taught you and are with you, which is all, all of you that are watching. And uh, I've gotten a lot of support and I want to yeah. say thank you to everyone, really. Yeah, thank you. And I, I receive and hear what you're saying. Do you remember me saying the little short vignette about when Peg and I were talking about this years ago? We were very early on in our training. I think maybe we were both ordained at that time, but she was my attendant at Austin Zen Center one morning when I was being the senior priest to open the Zendo. We had a private time at the Kaisando, the Founders Hall, where we were doing our vows and I was offering incense. And she kind of whispered to me, how did you get to be the way you are? And I said, because so many people have loved me so much. Yeah. And then in true peg fashion, she said, that gets you halfway. That gets you halfway. It's necessary to have all of this love. And then you have to step into the practice, like you're saying, and meet life as it is. Yeah. Yeah. And all of that's required. And I've just got to admit, it's like sometimes I just don't want to do the freaking other halfway. That's and nice. I just want, I want Flint to make it right. I want Peg to make it right. And then I just step back and recognize that that's so my humanness and we've all got it. <laughs> Find a lean in, knowing that you'll have to stand back up. Yeah, we, that's. And that's what we enact when we bow. We go down to the floor because it takes us to our knees, but then we stand back up. Say, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Take our love with you, Darcy. Oh, I will and I do. Thank you. Oh, I have to say, is it okay if I say about your finger? Oh, yeah. Do you see okay. Darcy's finger? Suzuki Roshi had exactly the same broken finger. And in the pictures in the stained glass at San Francisco Zen Center, it's exactly the same gusho. <laughs> I love that. Thank you for sharing that with me. Is Penelope next? It's me. <laughs> Hello, and um, I, I just have to thank you, Flint, for your wonderful teaching today. And it just threw me back on the arc of my life um, when, and thanks, Wayne, because of his wonderful comments um, and reflections about the TA, because uh, I raised my little girls who are now 50 and 52 uh, with TA for tops. Mm -hmm, right. You remember that book? Is I do. It, remember that? And uh, that was such a, I, I just, I mean, it just, that was the early 70s. And the whole culture was so excited about, um, I guess, for me, it was the first time to start waking up, you know, from my strict Catholic upbringing and, you know, being able to see, just like you say, that awareness that the first 
kind of awareness for me. And I wanted to share that with my children. And that's been our lifelong, you know, my girls are very close and I, with me, and I feel like I hadn't even thought about it. And when you start talking about that, it just, I started thinking of the whole circle. I didn't even know about Buddhism at that point. That wasn't part of my path. And um, it, was, it was in some ways um, the beginning of the Dharma for you. And even yeah. though you haven't thought about it, you still embody it and express it. Because my sister getting her studio is informed by her connection with you too. Because another artist, a senior person saying, do your work, you know? And oh, by the way, the first time I ever met John yes. was at a training group in San Antonio. Really? How, and that was when you were 24? Yeah, I would drive from Kingsville, Texas, all the way to San Antonio once a month to spend a day in a training group that happened to be there. So just small side note, since you're in San Antonio, well, you're in New Braunfels right now, but you know. But he wasn't in San, he wasn't based in San Antonio, right? This is he did like I do, traveled and taught. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I am my teacher's student. Well, I'm glad you're traveling on Zoom because today was so amazing. I mean, I was furiously writing all the questions down because um, they're just so, you know, we we just, I, I know everybody else has something to say, but just real quick, I, I loved where you said we have to decline the invitation to busyness that our culture presents. I uh, too. Elevate but excitement over intimacy. I spent my, my morning doing all these millions of things so I could then write my journal. But, you know, anyway, thank you. <laughs> You're quite welcome. Looks like maybe we have one more, Ra. There she is. Lovely to see you. Um, I just found myself raising my hand. Um, I have nothing particular to say. But, but you had an impulse. I had an impulse and it was to step into life right here um, to say hello to you and to step into the intimacy that I was feeling as I watched everyone on the screen. Take good care of that impulse. Mm. It's like an ember that can provide that energy for meeting life as it is, stepping forward when you'd rather not, mm. finding, finding intimacy where you didn't expect it. Mm. Yeah. Good care of that, that place. Yeah. Not just as an idea, but like no. action. It's the, it's the taking the step to and listening to you talk, I was just aware of gosh I'm holding like how I hold back from actually really choosing to live yes all the ways and it can get disguised because I can throw myself into work but we can be busy but miss our life yeah but you're right on the key are you going to choose the life that you have and really engage it? Yeah. Yes, really curious to sit in that question. Yes, and like Kathy was um, saying from Joko, meaning life as it is, minus our opinions about it. Mm. Our opinions will show up. And that's part of life as it is, minus our opinions about the opinions. Just keep taking our reactivity out of the center place and but hold all of ourselves fully. Mm. So I'll, I'll continue if you will. Yeah, and I'd like to continue meeting you. 
Okay, it's a deal. Thank you, Flynn. Welcome. And in reflection of these things that we've we've spoken about, and the one sentence of Dharma that, that Kathy brought forward from Joko, we'll chant the four practice principles. Caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way. Caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering. Holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher. Being just this moment, compassion's way. Caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering. Holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher being just this moment, compassion's way. Thank you all for stepping forward and for being here and for providing the energy to hold this life together. Maria? Thank you so much, Flint. Um, Appamada's programs and facilities are supported through your generosity and your support makes a huge difference. There is a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org and this link will take you towards an opportunity to offer dana to teachers such as Flint and Peg as well as other teachers like Laurie, Todd and Joel, some of our other wonderful teachers. Um, and there's also an opportunity there to contribute towards events such as classes and practice discussions. Thank you so much, everybody. And we now move on to the next part of our evening, afternoon, morning, <laughs> which is uh, after inquiry. So if you'd like to stay to meet for a further 30 minutes, then please do. Um, and if you'd like to take a couple of minutes break, um, or as Peg would call it, a bio break, um, then please do and meet us right back here. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody.